Hey, welcome back to Crimes and Closets. This is Beth in my closet in North Carolina. And this is Christy in my closet in St. Louis. Happy Monday. Happy Monday. Number three. Oh, yes. Yeah. Wait. Yeah, it's number three. <laughs> yes, <Yeah, laughs> you're right. <laughs> Miscounted. Um. Yeah. It's it's we're rolling along. Um. We have. I wanted to bring this up because I just posted something about it. A shirt on our website, our merch website that says, "I survived serial killer September with crimes and closets." If you guys are survivors, you can go get a T-shirt that tells the mm. world. <laughs> That you've been there, so does not survive serial killer September, yes. got the t-shirt. Okay. Yeah. Um, so what's going on with you? Not a whole lot. I mean, it's fall, pretty much. It not really. I mean, weather wise, it's not. But right. Like time of year it is. <laughs> right. It is. And I am on my way to you very soon. I'm real excited about it. It's this week. This week that this drops, I am coming to the loo to party. So excited about that. That's like ridiculous. Like You know what's insane. so fun about it too is that this whole thing is really kind of for my birthday. Mm-hmm. But it's which is not even – it's not even <laughs> it's a month. It's one month before. I know. <laughs> which just says to me – that I'm going to start celebrating my birthday. <laughs> I mean, why not? Why would you stop? Once you start, you can't stop mm-hmm. until your birthday. Exactly. So thanks. Thanks for that. Yeah, thanks for welcome. giving me a whole 30 days or more. <laughs> <laughs> um, speaking of fall, my son mm-hmm. had a football kickoff mm-hmm. jamboree. Okay. My mm-hmm. oldest son. Middle school ball. And so they played every team that they that's in the conference was at the Jamboree and they played each team for like 20 plays or something Mm -hmm. just for fun. It's just so that the teams can like introduce themselves to big kickoff party, whoop, whoop, yay, you know, season Mm -hmm. opener. So at the end of the Jamboree, all of the team, all of our boys on our team ran into the middle of the field and were like in this big circle, like screaming and yelling. And like there was people in the middle of the circle and we mm-hmm. were all, all of us parents were like, what are they doing? So we go over. One of the little middle school boys had a shirt that said on. He was wearing a shirt, a t-shirt that said, will you be my girlfriend? Check yes or no. And he went up to one of the little cheerleaders and handed her a Sharpie and a flower and let her t- <laughs> check yes or no if she wanted to be his girlfriend. And she checked yes, and then he gave her a kiss. Oh, <laughs> oh my <laughs> gosh. Cutest little story ever. That's very cute. I know. I don't know how the, the girl's mother felt. Right. About her father or parents or whatever. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know her. But the young man that... Um, asked her to be his girlfriend is a very sweet southern oh young man and i just thought that was the cutest thing and i just wanted to tell that on here because it's serial killer september and it warmed my heart and i yes. just thought you guys might want a little like young love story. little sweetness a little yeah, sweetness well, in our life <laughs> i know some eighth grade romance oh my gosh so how cute. cute is it to ask a girl that way though i know yeah, I know. It was that the is... cutest thing. And then they got a picture of him with the shirt on and her holding the Sharpie and it had the big check mark under yes. It's cute. Could you just imagine if, I mean, like, clearly, I don't know what the chances of this happening, but could you just imagine if they got married one day and they were like, this is how it all started? Well, he would definitely have to propose that way. Uh, oh, yeah, you would. <laughs> oh, will you marry me? Check yes or no. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Okay. When they have social media, if they have social media, let's follow them. Yep. <laughs> Forever. Is it too soon to send out the save the dates for the wedding? Because we're rooting for you. <laughs> You've got them married off already. That's right. I'll, I'll keep you posted along okay. the way if they stay together. Yeah, please, please do. We'll see what happens when the season's over. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, that's true. And I thought it was so cute too that it was like a football player and a cheerleader. And right. anyway, just yeah. all the all the cute vibes. So it is. <laughs> All right. Well, if we're done with cuteness, would we like to talk about another serial killer? Yeah, sure. We can. Okay. We'll do that. 
I mean, mm -hmm. it's it's what we do. Okay. <laughs>
Le Robla. Wow. Very French, obviously. Mm -hmm. And I have a French friend who listens and she's going to be like, oh, girl. (laughs) Sorry about that. (laughs) So this was when Louisiana was actually a Spanish colony. Mm Mm-hmm. So it was governed by the country of Spain, but it already had a very, um, like, big French and Creole population, Mm, Okay, which is why that city is so amazing is because of the French Creole Mm -hmm. influence and a little bit of Spanish. So Delphine, that's what she went by, was a Pisces, which I don't know. I just feel like she was a Pisces. Delphine's family was extremely prominent in the community. Her uncle was the governor of Louisiana and Florida. What? So they were like connected at the time oh, as far as like, like management. Okay. I was like, you could do that, but this is <laughs> a long time ago. Got it. Long time ago. They were under similar management. Would he? And her, he a, oh, never mind. I'm not going there. Keep on going. Okay. Mm-hmm. And her cousin was the mayor of New Orleans. So her family oh. is very rooted, like governor of Louisiana mayor of New Orleans, all related to her closely. Mm -hmm. They were all well-known and very well-regarded, and Delphine grew up very privileged. I have no clue what her parents actually did for a living. I just know they had nice things and were a part of high society. Okay. So as was customary for rich white people at that time, Delphine's family enslaved several people in their home. Mm Mm-hmm. So it was said that Delphine's parents were actually very good people and they were very com- kind and compassionate and even to their enslaved and to like the African American population in general, which like, I don't know, the, the, the fact that somebody has to write about that. It's like, yeah, you should be nice. You just just be nice. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, <clears throat> I'm 100% not defending any of this, but there were definitely people that it was like, this is just what you did, Mm -hmm. but maybe you didn't believe in it, but you did it and you treated them better than other people were treating. Um, yes. It's also said that Delphine's father had like a very open relationship with a free African-American woman, which again was like very just the times. Mm -hmm. This was not uh, one of his enslaved. This was just a a free woman and they had Mm -hmm. a child and that this child was actually accepted into their family as a part of their family. And Delphine was actually the godmother of the child. Oh, okay. How did she become such a horrible person? It's a great question. Okay. Thank you. Great question that we don't know the answer to actually. Okay. Okay. In 1971, when Delphine was four years, not 1971, (laughs) In 1771, when Delphine was four years old, there was a Haitian revolution. I don't know if you've heard about this. So it was basically where the enslaved population had an uprising and tried to fight Uh their captors, essentially. So Delphine's uncle, who was the governor, was actually killed by some of the people that he had enslaved in his home. And this revolution had Southern slaveholders like very nervous about their their own enslaved and like them uprising mm-hmm. and killing them. And so they in turn would treat their slaves even harsher oh. and more cruel in order to like, quote, keep them in line. So instead of like, maybe we're doing something wrong here and these people shouldn't be captors in our home, they were harsher on them. So Delphine, who was young, maybe it wasn't happening in her home, but this was something that was happening just in general. Right. Okay. In June of 1800, Delphine, who was 13 at the time, actually got married for the first time. She married a man named Don Ramon de Lopez y Angulo. Wow. Don Ramon. That's what we're going to call him. Okay. He was a very high-ranking Spanish officer in New Orleans, so it is safe to say that he was not also 13. Mm, No. Or probably even 23. Oh, my gosh. After a few years of marriage, Don Ramon was offered a high position in the Spanish military, so in 1804, 
he and Delphine started this very long journey to Spain where he had been summoned to be a consul, like a consulate for mm -hmm. the city of New Orleans. During their travels, which this takes months and months and months, Delphine became pregnant. But then when they were stopped, like docked in Havana, Cuba, Don Ramon suddenly died. Oh. Unexpectedly. And his okay. cause of death is unknown. He fell ill. Okay. Well. A few days after he died, Delphine gave birth to a daughter that she named Marie Borgia, and she called her Borquita for short. So here she's 17, Delphine. Mm -hmm. She's stranded in Cuba, widowed, and now has a daughter. So once she and the baby were able, Delphine left Cuba and went back to her home in New Orleans, where she resumed her privileged life and prominent society. Okay. Four years later, in 1808, at 21, Delphine married a Frenchman named Jean Blanc. Jean Blanc was a prominent banker, merchant, lawyer, and legislator. Okay, well. Isn't the times? I know. It's like, you could just have four careers. Yeah, just do it all. Just be a dentist, doctor, vet, lawyer. It's funny Say to think about now, but it is like that. Banker, merchant, lawyer, and legislator. Hmm. Okay. They bought a nice home in the French Quarter of New Orleans that was known as Villa Blanc. Jean Blanc and Delphine actually went on to have four more children together. So they had three daughters and a son. So Delphine has five children total. Because remember, mm -hmm. she had the daughter with the mm -hmm. first husband that passed. Mm -hmm. Delphine and Jean Blanc seem to have lived a very normal, high-class, wealthy New Orleans life for eight years. She was known for her beauty and her social status. I did read in one source that she actually met the queen at one point, and the queen was very impressed by her beauty. She doesn't look that pretty to me in pictures, but, like, I'm not really sure what was, like, attractive in the 1800s, mm -hmm. so. Okay. But in 1816, however, Jean Blanc, her husband, passed away suddenly. Uh, another sudden death? His cause of death is also unknown. Huh. Interesting. He fell ill. Okay. There's a pattern? In, I mean, some would say. Mm -hmm. In Jean Blanc's will, he actually requested that one of the enslaved men at their home be freed. So it was like someone he was close to and he was like, when I'm gone, I want you to go and like live your okay. life. Seems like a nice-ish man. Mm -hmm. Delphine did honor this request, but it took her three years. What? But okay. high society at this time was like, oh, Delphine is so kind and compassionate and rich and pretty, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I bet based on everything that I just said that you probably think that I'm going to say that Madame Lalari was a husband killer. A hundred percent. Yeah. But you would be wrong. Well, I don't like to be wrong. She, she th this, she's well known for other things. Yeah, great. Although speculation is, yes, speculation is still out about her husband's. It's kind of folklore, so we don't really know. It doesn't exactly make me excited for her third husband, who would be her last. In June of 1825, at 38 years old, Delphine married a 23-year-old doctor named Leonard Louise Lalari. It's a mouthful. So he was 15. <laughs> it's everything about this is a mouthful. <laughs> so much <laughs> Lalari is very hard to say as well. <laughs> Delphine is kind of a big name. Mm packs a punch or something anyway so she marries her third husband he's a lot younger than her he's like 15 years younger at this time delphine was worth an estimated sixty-seven thousand dollars, which in today's money would look like 2.2 million so ha sasata <laughs> it was said that the marriage between Mr. and Madame Lalari may not have been the happiest, but we don't really know. We do know that in 1831, six years after their marriage, Delphine bought a piece of property in her own name only. 
So Mm -hmm. her husband was not on the deed at 1140 Royal Street. And on that piece of property, she had a beautiful three-story mansion built. Although Delphine and Leonard did live there together with two of Delphine's daughters, it was considered to just be her home. Okay. Delphine and Leonard remained prominent members of high society in New Orleans. They often threw lavish balls and galas in their giant mansion in the French Quarter. In order to keep, keep up with the grounds and the housework, they did have, and to have people to help them with their parties, Delphine enslaved several African American people and she housed them in what she called servants' quarters that were actually specifically built into the home. So when she had the house built, she had a special area just dedicated to where she would keep servants, as she called them. Well, thanks, in- Adam. <laughs> How very kind, right? In 1832, Delphine, who was 45 at the time, filed for a, okay, this is quote, petition for separation from bed and board. So Delphine claimed that Leonard, she said, in quotes, treated her in such a manner as to render their living conditions unsupportable. So basically, I think she filed for legal separation, citing amicable differences. You know, the times. Delphine's children also confirmed that she was being mistreated by Leonard. Although the petition was granted, it did seem that Leonard still stayed often at the mansion. So their actual relationship status is unclear. Um, So, like, they were legally separated, but he was there, like, all the time. Like, he was at the parties. He was with the kids. He – I don't know where else he lived, if anywhere, but um, anyway, he wasn't there all the time. Delphine continued to throw these lavish parties and balls, and she continued to have, um, you know, her house of enslaved people living in their servants' quarters. She was just being super rich all the time, just high society. So Delphine always seemed to be very polite and concerned about the well-being of the people who were enslaved in her home. However, as time went, like in public at her parties is what I mean. You know, people would come over and she would be like, are you too tired to finish the, you know, the party? Feel free to go to bed, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, But as time went on, people began describing them as like worse and worse quality. They were actually described as, quote, haggard and wretched. Oh, and wretched. What does wretched mean? (laughs) Well, wretched means like being in a poor state, Mm. like a sad state. Okay. In some way. Okay. Like not well. Mm -hmm. So rumors began swirling around New Orleans high society that Delphine actually may possibly be mistreating and abusing the enslaved population that was in her home at the time. It was said that she was known to beat them and that she kept them chained up so that they wouldn't go places in the home that she didn't want them to go. And she refused to feed them. And she would even punish her daughters if her daughters tried to sneak them food. Oh my gosh. You know, that reminds me of like, I mean, all I'm picturing is like the, the ships that are like, Oh my gosh. Yeah. Chained to the, to the boat. Anyway, um, this is like just bringing back awful. awful. Yes, I know. I'm sorry. It's terrible to talk about that. This happened in real life, but it Mm -hmm. happened in real life. Mm -hmm. Um, at the time in Louisiana, there was a Mm -hmm. law that actually was supposed to, I'm quoting, putting this, like protect the enslaved Mm -hmm. from this type of treatment. So this law read, the slave is entirely subject to the will of his master who may correct and chastise him, though not with unusual rigor, nor so as to maim or mutilate him or to cause death. Uh, Ah, 
Yes. <laughs> <That's what they're> <laughs> <laughs> well, basically they're saying you own this person and feel free to punish them at will. It's mm-hmm. your prerogative to do that, but don't like make it so that they're deformed or permanently injured in any way and don't kill them. Okay. Good parameters to have, I guess. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's sad because most states at the time had no laws protecting the enslaved population. So really, Mm -hmm. Louisiana was like ahead of its time. Okay. (laughs) Terribly sad. Right. Yeah. Terribly ridiculous. Awful. (laughs) So authorities were actually alerted about these rumors that were going around, the allegations of mistreatment, because they're illegal. And Delphine's house was visited on two separate occasions to investigate. But while they were there, they reported seeing no signs of ill treatment or abuse. Hmm. But you have to remember, Delphine was a very prominent member of high society and her family was like well-rooted in politics in Louisiana and New Orleans. And she had a lot of money. So what they actually saw is like kind of look the other way type thing is right what i that that's just me right right thinking like well she paid him off mm-hmm. <laughs> that's what happened there there was an instance however that she was not able to get completely unscathed away from delphine was actually seen chasing a young enslaved girl around the house like around the outside of her home with a bullwhip what what's What's that? I mean, you have to Google a bullwhip, but it's literally a whip used to correct freaking bulls. It is humongous. That's what I I was Googled it too. But I was like, I don't know what that looks. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It is not like low key looking at all. That looks like one of the um, things from like the circus. Yes. Like corral an elephant or something like Mm -hmm. that. Yeah. It's very Mm -hmm. big like that. So. This little girl was running away from like an enraged and screaming Delphine. And people saw this, like neighbors saw this. This is not a rumor. This actually happened. She actually ended up running like outside of the house up through the staircases, like the porches, and she made it to the roof and she fell off the roof (gasps) trying to escape. No. So obviously this is far. This is a tall place and she died on impact. Mm. Oh my gosh. So this little girl was, she was 12, 12 years old, and her name was Leah. And it was later said that she had been brushing Delphine's hair and she pulled too hard and hurt her. And that's what set Delphine off. And so she was beating her. And this little girl ran away and ended up dying at the hands of Delphine. Oy, oy, oy. So because a bunch of people saw this happen, police were called and an investigation was done into Leah's death. Delphine was found guilty of illegal cruelty and was fined three hundred dollars. Well, which is a lot back then. It's ten grand. Okay. It is not what Leah's life was worth by any means. No. no. But she was forced to forfeit the nine remaining enslaved that were at her mansion at the time. Hmm. So they took away everyone else. Okay. Which she did. She she was like, okay. However, not long after, all of the same people were seen back enslaved in her home because she just bought them back. How? I, okay. <laughs> it's because of she's this rich white political family. I know, but she, okay. I just, whatever. There wasn't a clause of, and you can't buy them back, I guess. Yeah, obviously you have been convicted of being cruel and mistreating enslaved people in your home, and it's illegal in Louisiana, so do your own laundry. Oh my gosh. Um, Leah was actually also buried on the Lalari Mansion grounds. Yeah, okay. So, other than Leah's confirmed murder, the number of enslaved who were murdered at the hands of Delphine is actually unknown. There are 12 confirmed deaths at the Lalari Mansion before 1834. So we do know that there was a 70-year-old woman named Bon who died while enslaved at the mansion. I'm not 70, 30. She was a 30-year-old woman. Oh, okay. 
who died while enslaved at the mansion, and her four children also actually died later. They were 13-year-old Juliet, 10-year-old Florence, 6-year-old Jules, and 4-year-old Leontine. Those deaths at the time were believed to have been infectious disease. Okay. But now, what we know now, what we found out later on about Delphine, they all seemed to be foul play. Oh. There were six other names of people who passed away, or six other funeral records, I'm sorry, okay. of enslaved people that passed away in her home, but their names were not listed, which is okay. very sad. And no causes of death were ever listed for any of these people. So there's like a record that someone passed away and that remains had to be dealt with. And that's it. But who knows who they are? Who cares who they are? Kind yeah. Of ex- I mean, I care and it breaks my heart. No, I know. I'm just saying at I'm that right. time, that's what it was. It was like, yes. who cares? It doesn't matter who they are. That's right. These were disposable members of society and just, you'll have to just buy another one, Delphine. <sighs> yeah. It's gross. Okay. That was until on April 10th of 1834. Everything, it hit the fan. Okay. All the secrets of the LaLaurie mansion came to light. On this day, a fire started in the kitchen of the mansion. So Delphine and her husband, Leonard, who was there, Mm -hmm. and the two daughters actually got out of the house. And some things like her jewelry, her robes, managed to get those things out. And neighbors and people started to notice like the fire and the smoke. And they gathered around the house to see what was going on, how they could help. Delphine acted like everything was fine. She was like, we'll just call the fire department. I got out what I wanted. It's going to be okay. But little by little, people were like, well, where, where is her servants? That's what they called them. And mm-hmm. where are her servants? And they were asking, like, where are these people that live in her home? They're mm-hmm. not out here. And so they kind of started, like, walking the perimeter of the house, and they could hear voices coming from the inside. And they were like, oh, my gosh, there's people in there. Oh, gosh. Like, we need to get in. And so all of the doors had been locked. So they couldn't get in any of the doors. And these doors, which you'll see when I post a picture of the house, it was like a wooden door. And in front of the wooden door was an iron gate. Okay. So because it's like street level New Orleans, you Mm -hmm. know how there's just like wrought iron gates everywhere Mm -hmm. in New Orleans. And so people couldn't just go and knock on your door. There was okay. a gate in front of it that would like protect it. And the gate was also locked. So she locked them in. Yes. And had the keys and was just standing there. Mm-hmm. So they pleaded with her to give them the keys and open the doors. And I don't know what her response was, but she didn't. One person was heard yelling at her. There are human beings locked in those rooms who will be roasted alive in flames. What is wrong with you, lady? Mm-hmm. That's what Which I want to they- know. That's exactly what I would say. And Mm -hmm. I would also physically remove the keys from her possession. Mm -hmm. But anyway, Delphine told him there was nobody to worry about inside, you know, whatever. Finally, some men, some very brave heroes decided to break down the gates and break down the doors and they were able to get inside the home. And what they found would shock the entire town. And this is why we all know of Madame Laurie. La Laurie. So the first thing they found was the source of the fire, Mm -hmm. which was in the kitchen. There was a 70-year-old woman chained by her ankle to the stove. What? And the stove was on fire. So they were able to put out the fire and get the woman out who said that she was the cook of the house. Oh my Chained to a stove. As they continued through the house, they made their way to the servants' quarters, what they call that. Inside that locked door was like a house of horrors. So they found seven enslaved people, all wearing spiked collars around their neck Mm. and either chained to the wall or suspended by their collars. Oh, my gosh. Mm Mm-hmm. They were in cages. They were bound in various ways, 
all of them were emaciated. They had been beaten. They were badly scarred. Like it looked like some of them had been whipped with um, like whips and stuff Mm -hmm. over the years. They had like random cut marks and scarring all over them. They had signs of being starved, whipped, cut up. And then they were also put in like unnatural positions for long periods of time, which made it so that their limbs were like stretched out in weird ways or like just horrific. Yeah. So all seven of these people were taken out of the house and out onto the street. And when other people that were in the street saw the condition that these people were in and the the things that they had been forced to endure in that house, they were like sickened and furious Mm -hmm. And they start looking for Delphine and her husband, like saying they wanted her blood, like she has to pay for this, but she was gone. She was nowhere to be seen. She had already fled. Like during the chaos, whenever I guess they broke in, she was like, well, I guess it's time for me to go. So by the time people realized what was inside the house and what was going on, she was gone. Jeez. So then they realized this, like that she ran away. And so they were even more outraged and they actually formed a mob and went into the house and destroyed everything. Like broke out all the windows, ripped up all the furniture, all the land, all of her nice, fancy things were absolutely like in ruins, literally trashed the place. So word spread quickly about what was found at the Lalari mansion and everyone was looking for Delphine, but no one has ever found her. Ever? Ever. Which I will talk about a little bit later, like the speculation. So the 70-year-old woman who was chained to the stove admitted that she actually set the fire on purpose in an attempt to either end her life or have other people come in and save it. Because she was so badly like punished and tortured and she was scared for her life. And she said that she was being afraid. She was afraid of being taken upstairs because anyone who went into that room never came back. (gasps) Two of the enslaved people that had been rescued from the mansion ended up dying Mm -hmm. as a result of their torture. And the remaining five which this is also terrible and sad, ended up becoming somewhat like of a spectacle. So they were actually put on display at a local jail in New Orleans and up to 4,000 people came to see them to, quote, convince themselves of their suffering. What? So we talk about this sometimes with old timey cases on the Patreon, especially there was one that I can think of, but like there were no newspapers at this time really to like get information out there. And so there was this rumor of this woman that they needed to hang essentially or put in jail as a result of her torture of people. And so then they were like, well, they, the people need to see the people for proof that this is what she actually did. So so they put them on display. They're alive, though. They were alive, yes. I mean, and they're they on dis- them. display in the prison. Yes. Okay. Yes, it's gross. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The times. Mm-hmm. The mansion grounds were dug up, and they did find several bodies that had been buried on those grounds, including the 12-year-old little girl named Leah that fell from the roof. Mm-hmm. But those bodies were never identified. We don't know who their names are. We just know that they died in the house or were somewhat adjacent to the family. Like I said, Delphine was never seen again. So it is believed that she got on a boat and traveled to Mobile, Alabama. And I'm assuming they're thinking this because they found like boat records of some sort that Mm -hmm. were vague and they thought, Oh my gosh, she totally could have been on that. Mm -hmm. But she hid there for a time and then eventually went to Paris and lived out the rest of her life in hiding. Because remember, her family was originally from Paris. Right. She was not. She was born in Louisiana, but they're French. There are death records in Paris that say a woman by the name of Madame Delphine LaLaurie died there in December of 1849, which would have made her 67 years old. If that is her, it says that the cause of death is an accident while boar hunting. Well, yeah. 
Okay. I don't know what the accident is. I mean, of course I was like, she got attacked by a wild boar, but she might've just got shot or something or like fell. I don't know if that's her. However, there are others that believe she never actually left New Orleans that she just changed her name and appearance and used her money to live out the rest of her life undetected. There is a tombstone at the St. Louis Cemetery in New Orleans that says, Madame LaLaurie, née Marie Delphine McCarty, December 1842, which would have made her 62 when she died. That's her. Hmm. And you can go and see the, like, stone. Okay. Yeah. Well, I don't but want to. <laughs> somebody may have also just put that stone there for yeah. like folklore, you know, and all that mm-hmm. stuff. Her body has been searched for, but has never actually been found. So nobody really knows what ended up happening to her. So could they exhume that whoever's in that grave? There's and, nobody in it. Oh, it's just a stone. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. There was it. nobody in either grave. Okay. They can't, they don't know where she is. No one knows what happened to her. Yeah. So the other thing that we won't know is her victims, how many there actually were and what their names, all of their names are and all of that stuff. Even the ones that were tortured in her home that were rescued, Mm -hmm. you can't find those names anywhere. Hmm. So it was a very long time ago, but still, it does make me sad that over all these years, nobody's ever been able to find them. And give right. them a name. Right. But and she's she was, listed as a serial killer. She Well, they know she killed a whole bunch of people. Yeah. They just yeah. don't know who they all were. Mm-hmm. But yes, I've, it's proven that she tortured and murdered these people. Mm-hmm. So, and she was never punished, which is also terrible. Yeah. I mean, unless the boar got his, but still. I hope she so. still lived to be in her 60s. So the original house was too badly destroyed to be habitable because of the vandalism. So the fire actually didn't do do all that damage. It was the enraged people. Mm -hmm. It remained like that in a dilapidated condition, untouched for four years. But then in 1838, an impression mansion was built in its place. So this mansion on the outside was made to look exactly like it did originally. But obviously the inside was different. Oh. Over the years, it has been used as a public high school, a music conservatory, and an apartment building, and like some stores. In 2007, the actor Nicolas Cage bought the house for $3.4 million. Does he live there? He did live there whenever he bought the house. You know Nicolas Cage lives in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. He has a very, very giant mausoleum that he built in New Orleans. Did you know that? No, I did not. Yes. He has a, you can go and see it. It is really big. (laughs) Hmm. He is like very rooted in New Orleans, but he, the house was foreclosed on a couple of years later because I don't know if you remember, but he was in like a messy lawsuit where his money manager was suing him for like misappropriation of funds. So he like lost all of his properties and stuff. Oh, okay. So after that, it was built, sorry, it was bought for a little bit over $2 million by a nam- man named Michael Whalen, and he is the current owner of the house now, and it is a private residence. Hmm. So there are just people that, they, that's just their house. Right, yeah. Um, I was there a couple of years ago and took some pictures, which I will post. I went by the house and you could, I mean, it really is just a private rev. Like you could see curtains and then through the curtains, you could just see people sitting there watching TV and walking around and all of that. So huh. he, d- he did not lean. Yeah. Well, it's on the ghost tour. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. People, everyone goes by and takes pictures of this house. It's not just me. It's a famous house. No, I mean the part of you could just look through the window and see people sitting oh. watching TV. And Well, because <laughs> I was fascinated I by that because I'm right. like never and ever would I, I wouldn't, I didn't want to touch the house mm-hmm. because well, for fear of bringing something home with me. Right. It's like the other, I mean, this is much worse, but it was like the other one in California, Dorothea. Exactly. Like, like who wants to live there, but yeah Yeah, i know but see those people leaned in and made it like a spectacle these people they're they're like leave us alone yeah right i mean green but but they're on the they're on the ghost tour so they're never left alone well no i think right exactly i don't know if that's their choosing i think it was just like that was just the ghost tour 
no, yeah, on their circuit or whatever. Um, so it is a huge story in New Orleans. It's been sensationalized. Like her number of victims has been embellished to be like over 100 people. And like the stories now say that like some victims were found with like their mouths sewn shut. There's like a story, but this is just all speculation. This Mm -hmm. is not proven. Some people say that, um, there was a person that had their bones broken and reset to look like a crab. Some people say that Delphine and her doctor husband were actually using enslaved humans for medical experiments to learn about like anatomy and stuff like that. Again, oh. this is all folklore. If you right. read the newspapers from back in the day, the state that these people were in is nothing like what people say now. Like it's all right. been very embellished. Um, but anyway, like I said, it is on the ghost hunting tour, so you can go and see it. I just think she was a sadistic person who liked to watch people suffer. That's my speculation on it. Um, But the folklore, if that's your thing, it's interesting. Just wondering like where it came from though. Because the only thing that I can pinpoint, which is actually why I brought it up, is because there was a time frame in which people did begin to be harsher towards their, their enslaved Mm-hmm. because of that rebellion and stuff that had happened. And so I don't know if it was like she saw that happen from a really young age because she was four when that happened, if that didn't like somehow mess her mind up and give mm. her like a proclivity for wanting to see that type of thing. Right. If right. that makes any sense. No, you know, it does. Like, I mean, exposed to something terrible at too young of an age, it imprinted mm-hmm. and – Also, I think she's just a sick lady who wanted her way on everything and was controlling and probably killed her husbands also um, to get what she wanted. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Gosh, man. Also, if – oh, and so everyone thinks that the mansion is haunted. There's like tortured souls there and stuff, which look. I'm not going over there. <laughs> You're right. Yeah. Not, uh, that is not, I'm not messing with that at all. And American Horror Story, um, I think it's season three, which is based in New Orleans. The character of Kathy Bates is loosely based on Delphine LaLaurie. Yeah. I remember that when you were telling yep. me that you were doing this and I was like, oh my gosh, that was awful. Yes. That's very um, like more voodoo mm-hmm. torture type thing. Um which nothing that I read ever said anything about that with the actual person, but right. it is a good episode. I mean, a good season of American Horror Story. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's who it's loosely based on. And the house is based loosely on this house and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah. Well, and I, I think I mentioned this to you um, off recording, but she was like putting their blood on her face and stuff. And, all that and you okay so i thought originally that that was accurate okay but it wasn't so that part of the story Mm -hmm. is actually talking about um what's her name bathory elizabeth bathory oh she did that she was a female serial killer from way back then she was a uh, a royal she in some way and she used to do that with people's uh, blood to put it on her face and on her body and she would drink it because yeah. she thought that um it kept her young mm. so they meshed them together okay and so i had originally thought like oh my gosh that really happened because i know it did really happen but it was a different person it wasn't delphine there's no nothing that i read that indicated that she did that got it okay i wouldn't put it past her right but I, there's no uh documentation it was her right okay doing that so very interesting it's very interesting it's very sad it's very awful it's um she's one of the worst people i've ever read about in my Mm -hmm. entire life like i can't imagine just living in a a house of horrors like that no and and it by choice like it was her Mm -hmm. choice to do Mm -hmm. that and live with these people that she was literally torturing and starving every single day like yeah i gosh i can't even imagine No. Nope. I don't want to. I don't want to imagine. I don't want to think about it. I don't. Mm -mm. Yep. I know. And that is the story of Delphine LaLaurie. Well, goodness gracious. That. Yep. 
again, I saw the American Horror Story. So like, I'm not shocked by any of the stuff that you just told us. Right. But it's holy shocking. moly, this is just awful. Ugh, this is it's yeah. too bad that mob didn't get a hold of her. Right. I know, like pitchforks mm-hmm. coming after her. Yeah. Yeah, I'm pitchforks. <laughs> such a visual right now you know, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh goodness <laughs> all i picture was the beauty and the beast when the town's like coming after the yes. beast <laughs> she is a beast <laughs> she is so man yeah. gosh well i'm sorry i know that you had you did struggle with this one and oh my like- gosh we should talk about that actually it took yeah. four different recordings to get this thing recorded four well, and i yeah and i but i was gonna say like previous to that you were questioning whether you should do this because you were just oh like, yeah awful I don't know if I should do it I don't think I want to blah, blah blah and then you know you came around and did it but then we kept getting interrupted with poor internet service on my end and we couldn't get it recorded and we had we I think there's like three three pieces of this that are gonna yes. get mushed together but after the first two you were like yeah I think maybe there's just a sign yeah I, I, did it. I told Wes like I, there's some bad energy going on with this case and like I I'm feeling it I'm feeling like something some kind well, of it's done now it's done now and I'm gonna sage mm-hmm. and it's gonna be fine <laughs> yes. yeah, okay yes. you just have to live you... through the editing of it because it's gonna that's take fine take a little bit more than usual <laughs> Right, right. That is totally fine. Anyway, we got it done. So I'm glad we could. I mean, even though I couldn't name all of these victims, like this happened to them and this is tragic and we need to do better and learn. And Mm -hmm. I mean, I think we did. We're better than that a little bit. But, you know, um, it's just sad. And it's sad for these people that didn't get justice. And so maybe if us talking about them, you know. This, this mm-hmm. happened to them and right. people need to know that. Yes. No, agree. So. Yeah. So thank you for bringing it out there and bringing right. it to everyone's attention. And I'm sorry that you had to endure that research for sure. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, serial killers. Serial killers. So we only have one more after this, right? I know. No? You won't hear from me anymore over here on this feed. You are done. Survivors over on the other feed. Yeah, I'm done. That's a wrap. Yeah, you made on it. To October and spook. <laughs> I know. You get to keep going. I, I mean, I'm like, uh, I'm still diving in on, yeah. on the last one. So, but it should be an interesting one too. So stay tuned next week for one last serial killer. And don't forget, we are going to do our special fun <laughs> um live All the live yes on the 25th which is yeah. the day the last day that um one drops is that right yes we yeah it's the last night or monday the 25th is the last one right that drops yes. and then yep. and we are going to be together here in the loo yes and so we're gonna do a live maybe mm-hmm. I mean, um, maybe, the, maybe the hubbies will make an appearance yeah they we'll should there. is it gonna be on youtube uh i think so unless you just want to do something on instagram no i just was asking for the people where they could go to find the live (laughs) yeah yeah i think we'll just stick to that because that's where we did it last time and then it's on there and it we can okay so if you don't if you're not on our youtube go over and just hit follow so you can be ready and get alerted when we go live so. Yeah, we'll just do a quick little like hey jump on if anybody has anything to say about these mm-hmm. heinous people questions yeah. whatever maybe the little discussion on what we were thinking mm-hmm. some of them but anyway all right thanks for joining us one last one you have to endure although I think some of you guys actually like this so um <laughs> and yeah. thanks for all of your support we really appreciate it. Go check us out on social media. You will get to see some pictures of this case and other ones. And just always remember, the world is scary. People suck, especially serial killers. Hide in your closet.